All right, everybody. Thanks for your time. If, um, if somebody would just jump in the chat and confirm to me that you uh, are picking up my audio okay, that would be useful. Got it. Cool. Thanks, Alan. Um, great. Well, I'm going to get started, and if anybody else rolls in, then they can uh, they can try to catch up and uh, get up to speed. So um, thanks, everybody, for your time. Today we're going to be talking about uh, cloud collaboration for Civil 3D. Uh, my name is Zach Graff. I know some of you uh, personally and some of you I don't. Um, I've been a, an engineer with CAD Masters for coming up on 14 years. Uh, working with Civil 3D and all the cloud stuff, um, so hopefully we can uh, you guys understand what's what's available for Civil 3D. Um, I have just a few slides that I'll go through in the beginning, and then I'll uh, jump into a practical demo for the for the majority of it. Um, I've got you all muted and everything. At, at the end, I'll uh, I'll pause and take questions, um, and we can unmute you guys, or you can ask them in the chat if you'd like. Um, if you want to ask questions while we're going in the chat, that's that's fine, but I probably won't address them until the end. Right. Um, trouble with my slideshow. The first question I want to address is why the cloud? And I'm sure you all have heard answers to this. Um, and in the specific case for Civil 3D um, and, and what you all do, these are some of the some of the reasons. So, the centralized common data environment. So of course, that's kind of the underlying principle. Um, we've got project-based workflows for review and approval processes. So, kind of built into this, what I'm going to show you today. Um, is the ability to create transmittals and reviews and whatnot. Looks like I've got it on timer. Um, I like that. Uh, so you've got reviews and the, uh, for the approval process, you can you know take files and, and run them by certain people and, and make sure that they go through the approval process. Uh, we can create transmittals in this uh, in this software, which are going to allow us to package up the files. Um, at a certain stage and uh, and kind of store them uh, for posterity as well as send them out to our uh, collaborators. A big one is reduced infrastructure needs. So I know a lot of our clients are coming to us and they're asking, you know, how can I basically get off my on-prem servers? Um, you know, uh, this is going to reduce your your need for uh, for local servers and uh, VPN to to get to your local servers when you're employees are, are decentralized, and we'll talk about it in a minute. Um, got mobile and web access for this stuff, so it allows you to take your drawings and your plan sets um, right into the field and on a, on a tablet or whatnot, uh, you know, do some markups or, or just review the sheets and plans that you've produced. And really, this is the big one, and this is probably why everybody's here. So it allows decentralized project teams to collaborate. So. You know, in our modern world, um, you know, I'm sitting in a home office right now. I'm sure some of you all are sitting in home offices and some of you in the office. Uh, what this really allows is your team to collaborate on projects um, from different locations simultaneously. So, like I said, without a VPN and without the need to everybody to get to the server, um, we can actually store all of our project data and all of our drawing files uh, up in the cloud. And then people can work on them wherever they are, you know, as long as they have an internet connection. Autodesk's uh, Autodesk's solutions to this uh, all kind of fall under the header uh, of Autodesk Construction Cloud. So you guys might hear that terminology, Construction Cloud, or it's also called ACC. Um, in the past, it's been under the header of BIM 360. So if you hear that. Uh, we're talking about essentially the same product, but uh, BIM 360 still exists, and it's kind of a parallel to what we'll talk about today, but almost used interchangeably. 
And so I want to go through some of these specific features, and I want to outline it to you all because this info is a little hard to grab um, in general online. I want to help you guys understand what's available in, in which of the products. So go through these specific features, and, and we'll talk about three things. Autodesk Docs, uh, Autodesk BIM Collaborate, then Autodesk BIM Collaborate Pro. And so each of those is a separate product within the ACC platform, and they each kind of uh, build on each other and, and uh, add functionality. So at the base level of Autodesk Docs, these are the things we'll, we'll talk about and look at today. So we've got some stuff for document management, like versioning. So it's going to automatically uh, you know, increment the version of your DWG files as you're operating. And you can go back and access those and, and do some comparison. Then I'll show you between different versions. We've got permissions. So we're going to build out the folder structure for our project. And within that folder structure, we can control the permissions um, for the individual users. So everybody doesn't have to have access to all the folders within the project. Um, you can control that by user, by role. So like you know, engineer versus drafter versus project manager. Or you can also control those permissions by, uh, by company. So if you wanted to have collaboration outside of your organization, you could actually uh, set the permissions. The folder, you know, certain folders are available to certain companies and not other companies. All right. Uh, built into this all is markups. So right there in the web, and I'll show this to you, you can, uh, you can mark up red line and text and draw uh, on your 2D and 3D models. Uh, also on PDF, and that kind of is available to the rest of the users within the project. Kind of this is kind of a quick and dirty, you know, let me show you something in the model. And it's kind of in contrast to the next one, which is issues. And issues are a formalized process by which you can you can mark issues in the design drawings, um, and you can assign them to individual people, and the data kind of follows along uh, inside of the project whether that has been resolved, who resolved it, uh, when it was you know, first uh, identified, and you, know, you can put dates on those issues as to when they need to be resolved by and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And again, all this document management stuff, versioning, all that kind of takes place in the cloud, um, which I will show you. Got some built-in project workflows, which I mentioned earlier. And so those, uh, those look like reviews and transmittal processes, so we can set up uh, review workflows whereby um, when documents get to the stage where they need a review, uh, we can set up a process where certain users, you know, the managers and the uh, design directors and whatnot, uh, have to review and approve documents uh, before they kind of get released. And then the other workflow is the transmittals, and that allows us to uh, choose files from within our cloud project. Uh, they can be DWGs, and they can also include you know, other files like Word documents and Excel documents and whatnot. Uh, we choose those at a, certain, at a certain version, and we package them up into a transmittal. You know, so we say we've got the 90% you know, submittal, transmittal, and we package those up. And then we continue working on the files. And if we ever need to go back, um, we've got the, you know, the right versions pulled into the transmittal as well as the ability to um, communicate to other users that that transmittal is ready and they can you know, take the files as they are and start to review. All this is built on web viewers. So as we get in there, I'll show you that, um, that the web viewers allow us to navigate our DWG files, both in plan, uh, sorry, both in model space and in uh, the layouts that we'll be creating. Um, and there's also web viewers for uh, uh, Microsoft stuff, so Office documents can be looked at in there, and then PDFs um, can also be opened directly in the, the web. Right. A desktop connector is a a part of this whole ecosystem, and it's a little app that runs. Uh, you can see it right here. Actually, that's that one. The desktop connector is the app that kind of facilitates. The other part of all this, which is uh, working with Civil 3D, AutoCAD, uh, Revit, if you were Revit users, um, it all kind of operates through desktop connector, which mounted drive, and then that mounted drive uh, contains all of our projects. And so we can uh, access 
files through the mounted drive. We can upload stuff through the mounted drive, um, all that kind of stuff. It also allows us to, uh, to localize um, files if we were going to go out into the field and not have an internet connection for a while. You do have the ability to synchronize and download uh, project files before you leave your internet connection. Otherwise, the desktop connector actually is uh, managing the documents and the DWG files as you go. So it's downloading them when you need them and then uploading changes and, and all that. Uh, and Sheet Set Manager. So there is a web-based Sheet Set Manager uh, for AutoCAD and Civil 3D that allows the Sheet Set to reside in the cloud with the DWG files that are in the cloud. Um, and you can publish from it, and you can uh, you can you know, fill in your title block with your uh, uh, with your dynamic text that tells you what the sheet name is and the sheet number and all of that. So all of that stuff is is there as well. I'm going to pause for a second. That's all within Autodesk Docs, and I'll point this out again when I get into the demo part. But all of that resides in Autodesk Docs, which is kind of the base of the platform. Uh, Autodesk Docs is included in the AEC collection, so if any of you all own the AEC collection, um, as opposed to just Civil 3D, you already have licenses of Autodesk Docs. And, um, and a lot of our users are, are using Autodesk Docs now because of that, so the AEC collection is allowing people to kind of delve into this world um, with Autodesk Docs. And then if you're collaborating with users outside of your organization, they're going to be bringing their own Autodesk Docs license. Uh, to collaborate on the project with you. And then just a note, you can also buy Autodesk Docs all by itself if uh, if you had, you know, maybe some project managers who didn't use Civil 3D at all but needed to participate in, uh, you know, the reviews and transmittals and whatnot. You can actually just buy Autodesk Docs licenses. All right. Um, the next one is uh, falls under BIM Collaborate, and this is not... We don't see a lot of use of just this. It essentially uh, works like Navis works, but in the cloud. So within your, your cloud-based project, it allows for clash detection you know, between the different disciplines in the cloud. And so uh, it's got these things called coordination spaces where you know, different people's models can be automatically clashed, and, and, um, and then you can push it back to the authoring tools and, and whatnot. Uh, not the purpose of today's conversation, but I wanted you to be aware of, of the terminology and, and what these products are. Okay. Now, the one, really the one that we are talking about today and uh, kind of uh, necessary for Civil 3D is what's called BIM Collaborate Pro. You also might see it called ABC Pro. And this tool is um, adds on a bit to Docs. It includes Docs, but it also adds on what we're going to call collaboration for Civil 3D. And so uh, what that allows is for data shortcuts to function fully uh, in the cloud. So if your workflow um, relies upon data shortcuts in Civil 3D, you would absolutely need BIM Collaborate Pro uh, for all of your users that are going to be collaborating in Civil 3D. Okay. And um, one thing I didn't mention, Autodesk Docs does allow you to save and open AutoCAD files, DWGs, directly from the cloud. Um, the piece that you need to add on with BIM Collaborate Pro is the, is the data shortcut stuff. Uh, right. uh, that, I am going to jump right in and show you all around a little bit. Um, I already mentioned that there's a mounted drive uh, which comes through the desktop connector. And so just to show you that real quick. Um, I only have one project loaded. You can choose which projects to load, but this is going to be my little example project, ABC Pro for Civil. And here's my folder structure. Um, I can go through here and uh, uh, and operate a bit. Within the folder structure, I can upload files. Um, but a lot of the management of, of Autodesk Docs actually takes place in the web portal. So um, once I'm all licensed up for this and I've got projects and everything, I come into uh, my user-based uh, web portal, and the first thing I see is all of my projects. And these projects can come from any number of organizations. I've got some internal. I've got some that I was invited to by um, you know, other, other organizations outside of CAD Masters. 
so I'll just filter this because I've got a lot going on. Um, filter this and onto just my project. And then I'll jump into our uh, our example project. And so we build this folder structure. Project files is already there. Uh, we build the folder structure however we want, and we can even set up templates. So if you all have, you know, a very typical project folder structure, um, it's very easy to uh, create a template that will create that folder structure every time you create a new project. Okay. Um, if I'm going to do it here on the fly, what I'm going to do is just come to this ellipsis button, and I'm going to add subfolders. So, you know, maybe I add a subfolder for sheets. And then the process of uploading, I just want to show you this right through the web portal. Um, I can just drag and drop those Explorer files, and it will upload them and process them, and then uh, I'll be able to go from there. And if I did it again, made a modification to this PDF and uploaded it a second time, uh, it would uh, it would version it right here. Version one would become version two and uh, they would all be stored in the cloud. It does not get rid of old data. Um, another thing is there's no storage limit. So you can put anything you want in your project, um, and uh, you can even put things like uh, point cloud scan data up there. We have, we have clients who store gigabytes of scan data uh, in their project. All right, so here I clicked on that. PDF that I just uploaded, and here's my uh, here's my web viewer for the PDF. Um, along this right side is all my markup tools, and so I'm able to add a markup um, text and everything. And this markup by default is not published, so me as the creator of this markup, I uh, I get it kind of in a draft mode until I basically click publish, and the moment I publish, everyone else with access to this file within this project uh, can see these markups in the web when they come to this view. I'll show you a little bit about permissions and how those work. Um, so you can set permissions, like I said, on any folder, and it applies to children. So if I go to project files and I go to permission settings, you'll see that I have uh, a couple people added, and those people have uh, management permissions. If I go down another folder, and I go to uh, this corridor model folder that I've created, and I look at permissions. Um, here I've actually got a permission for a whole company. I've got another individual user that I've added, um, and they've got edit permissions on this folder. And just to kind of show you, uh, what I have going on is I have a remote desktop, and I'm signed in as a different user. So this is that other user. And they only have access to one folder within the project. And so when they look you know, either in their mounted drive, they see under project files, all they see is corridor model. So they are not seeing data shortcuts, sheets, SSM, surfaces any of those folders. And so, you know, that allows us to have internally facing folders uh, and then externally facing folders. And, and again, these permissions can be assigned based on individual users, whole companies, or roles. Um, markups versioning issues. Uh, like I said, issues are a formal uh, problem with the design or with the drawing. And so we create issues, and they store all this kind of data. So they store the um, name of the issue, what the status of the issue is, different types of issues. And then we can assign that issue to individual users. We can assign it to roles, or we can assign it to companies to deal with the issues. Um, we can assign it to a specific location on uh, one of our files um, so that when you're looking at the file in the in the web viewer, you've actually got uh, a little link to the issue, and you can see where it is. Um, let me show you the web viewers for the actual EWG files. So 
honestly, the, the versioning, I think, is really cool. So here's a um, here's the DWG file that I've got uploaded. Um, see that it's locked. I'll talk more about that in a minute. But when I click on this, uh, it's going to open the file in a web viewer. Um, and that web viewer actually allows me to, uh, to view any of the layouts or model space of this drawing. So, I'll, you know, if I jump into the 2D view, which is just model space, I can see everything inside of this drawing file. Like I said, uh, with the PDF, you can do your markups and whatnot. But what I want to show you is actually the version comparison. And so if I up here to do version comparison, and I choose two different versions of the drawing to compare, I want to make sure I'm comparing apples to apples, so model space on both. Um, interesting. Shifted. Change. Document to another. Bear um, with me for one minute. Messed something up and shifted something. Um, what is cool, although it's not going to look that cool here, is that uh, the two versions sit side by side, and um, I can either compare by color or by this slider uh, and see what changes were made. Um, and it looks like I got a shift in my drawing. Right? Um, I want. But you can see that the uh, the parking lot and the lots around the cul-de-sac, um, I can see that they appear somewhere between these two versions. And so anytime you get a new version, you can come in and do your comparison, see what the differences are uh, right here in the viewer. Um, you can also roll back. So like if I uh, if I get a newer version and something's you know something's wrong with it, I'm able to uh, to roll back and. Uh, Um, I'm not going to spend a bunch of time on the reviews and transmittals, but like I mentioned, there's workflows for reviews, which allow us to have reviewers, and then they process the files as they as they get ready for release. Then transmittals package everything up into a, a almost like a zip file, right, where the specific versions of your files are tied to a specific transmittal. Um, Okay, great. Then I'm going to jump right into kind of the, not the web side, but the application side. And so what uh, what this really allows us to do is, like I said, not have, a, not have a local server for our projects, right? It allows our project teams who are spread all over the country or even around the world to access the project, uh, you know, same time and collaborate. And so uh, it's pretty opaque for the user. Um, you know, the difference is that when I go to open, uh, instead of going to my server, I go to, uh, to Autodesk Docs. I drill down into my folder structure, get to the files that I want to open. So we go through here, or in the newer versions, there's this built-in splash screen, which is just the same stuff allows me to come in here and open a file. And what's happening is the desktop connector in the background is actually you know, downloading that file, putting it uh, in a user folder on, on the computer, and then I'm opening it from that local space. And then anytime I save it, after I've made modifications, saves it locally, desktop connector takes that and pushes it back to the server. Um, I can... Uh, so that I can 
as soon as this file gets opened, um, there is file locking. So that's kind of critical to this functioning, right? Um, and so if I look into my folder structure on here, I look at these files. Right now, intersection finish is not locked. I, you know, I mean, it's not in use. But the moment that I open this file here, a desktop connector is going to tell uh, Autodesk server that that's locked, and that shows up immediately locked. Um, and it shows up immediately as locked for my other users as well. So, you know, here's my other user on the project, and they're coming along, and they want to work on this. And, you know, before they even get there, they see that it's locked. But if they try to open it, um, you know, they get sort of the typical uh, warning. Yet, if you were working on a, on a server, this file is actually loose and uh, If it shows it is locked, maybe I've already told it. Yeah, it's right protected. Um, I probably already told it to not warn me when the, when something's in use. That file locking works really well. Uh, it took them a while to get there, honestly, but uh, it is there now. Our file locking is pretty much instantaneous. You don't get any issues around that. Um, and so you just open and save. You know, you open a file just like you would normally. You know, you go in and you make your changes. Um, right, I, I modify the um, I, I make a modification to my my drawing file and uh, when I save that drawing file pushes those changes back up um, we'll see in the cloud that this should increment version to version 10 any of those changes are going to show up in the, um, the web viewer right away, uh, and, th and that whole process is going to work well. Uh, the same with XREF. So your external references, you know, those reside in the cloud. Well, when I, uh, you know, when I create the XREF, I save it to the cloud, and when I go to add an XREF, um, that XREF just gets added from my Autodesk Docs folder. Uh, and that relative path to that folder is saved, and then my, you know, the other users within my organization are able to open the file and see the extracts and everything. Uh, so it's pretty opaque uh, on that side, um, and I wanted to show you the the data shortcut part as well. Um, so now we're getting into BIM Collaborate Pro, and so you need BIM Collaborate Pro to be able to set your working folder. Uh, to you know, the right location for your cloud-based project. And so when I come in here, I've got to think for a minute about what I've got. These shortcuts, yeah. So project files is going to be my, my working folder. And then I've created and set a data shortcuts folder, uh, just like you're used to in Civil 3D. And so that's what this data shortcuts folder is. It contains the underscore shortcuts folder, which is the, the actual data shortcuts. And so very similar to how you use it on a server. And then workflow within the program is the same as it's always been. So you know, now I come in here to data shortcuts, and I create a data shortcut for my uh, all road surface from my corridor. And then if I wanted to uh, create a new drawing, take that drawing and save it to the project. So just the same way you're always operating in Civil 3D. And now when I bring in reference, everything looks pretty much the same to the user, um, uh, what's really going on, it's all taking place cloud.
landscape. So both those surfaces came from data shortcuts where both of those drawings exist in the cloud. Um, and when I save it, all this stuff happening very quickly. Now that that file is being uploaded, processing it because it's creating the um, the web viewer uh, file so that you can view it in the web. Uh, my other user doesn't have access to that folder, so they can't go look at it. But you know, it's locked; it's there for that user and everything. So um, it's really kind of interesting, right? It's uh, it's in one way groundbreaking technology for for civil 3D because it allows the the team to collaborate all over the place. But in the practicality of how it's used in civil 3D, uh, really not going to see much of a difference in your workflows. Uh, the workflow change being that when I look at my data shortcuts folder, it starts with Autodesk Docs, right? And when I look up here at the top of Prospector, uh, you know, it says cloud. But those files are just being managed behind the scenes by Desktop Connector, uh, allowing all of my users to collaborate on it. Um, they would on a on a local server, but uh, in the cloud. Right. Um, really, about all I wanted to show you guys. Um, uh, I will just mention that uh, this uh, has been around for a little while for Civil 3D. It's really just reached uh, prime time, so it's really now I think for the first time really ready for. Uh, for production work. Um, that said, the whole cloud platform is actually very tried and tested uh, because, as I said in my uh, slide here, collaboration for Civil 3D is kind of you know thing we're talking about. But collaboration for Revit, uh, in particular, has existed for many many years, and the platform here uh, has been used uh, by the Revit community for a very long time already, and uh, most of these kinks have been worked out already. So uh, I think it's pretty ready to go. Um, with that, I'm going to jump this slide and let you all ask any questions that you may have. Um, and I do believe I've got some already in chat. Um, yeah, let's see. First thing happened at the save of file or close. Yeah, uh, and if you if you feel like you need to ask your question via audio, let me know and I can unmute you. But um, I've got some questions in chat that I can uh, that I can answer. So the first question is: Does versioning happening at the save of a file uh, or close? It happens at the save of a file. Um, you still have the ability to close and not save. So it is not like you know in Google Docs, for instance, when I'm operating on a cloud file. You know, anytime I press a key, you know that that is being stored in the cloud. This is still a save process. So when you click save, that file is pushed to the cloud and it's versioned. Uh, if you don't click save, or if you crash and you haven't saved, or if you you know close and say I don't want to save, it does not get versioned. It does not get saved to the cloud. That's has got a question. Uh, yeah, you noticed the SSM folder, um, and you saw that you've seen that in another uh, another presentation. Well, um, and so let me jump out of this. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, the the SSM folder is not necessary by name. Uh, what it is is it's just uh, this is just a location for the uh, the uh, DST file. To sit. So the DST file is the the information that uh, enables a data shortcut. Uh, sorry, a, a sheet set to work. And so when you're using sheet sets in the cloud, that DST file has to sit somewhere within the project. Uh, nothing special about the SSM name or the folder or anything like that. It's just something I created to house uh, the DST file. I did get one question earlier about uh, what does bridge do. I believe what you're talking about, um, yeah, this bridge right here. Um, good question. I think yeah. So this is a tool for um, 
extending this even further. So, you know, we talked about Autodesk Docs, BIM Collaborate, and BIM Collaborate Pro, which kind of all fall into the design stage of a project. Um, but Autodesk Construction Cloud extends even further into products that are fall under the heading of uh, build, so Autodesk build. And those are for actual construction, right? So that's got, uh, that's got things like um, uh, checklists and, you know, safety meeting things and, uh, and all the kind of stuff you would need uh, for an actual construction project. And I believe Bridge is a, is a tool to take the data from this design stage and transition it into build. Yeah. Um, good questions. Okay. So uh, another question is how are user permissions set and do the roles affect these settings? Um, let's let's look at this example of, of my guy over here. Uh, my second user, they only see the folders uh, for corridor model, right? Now, um, Inside the project, you, you do need to be an administrator of the project, so there's different roles within the project. But if I go to my files, I look here, you know, if I want that user to be able to access the surfaces folder as well, uh, basically what I do is I hit the permission settings for that folder. And if it's just one user I want to add for this, I can do it user by user. So I actually look up the guy's name. Um, I look up the user's name, and then I choose the permission I want them to have, and then I add them. That works for that user to get access. Um, you know, an alternative, when I go to add, instead of choosing a user, I can choose a role. So I can say, you know, this is an engineer which is something I set. When I am the project manager uh, for this project, the, uh, the administrator, when I add these users to this project, I choose whether they're an engineer or a CAD manager or a project manager or what they are. Okay? And so I can add instead, say all engineers in the project get edit permission. Now, that means any user in this project that is assigned the role engineer will have these permissions. And any future user that I add to the project who gets the role engineer will also have these permissions on this folder. And then finally, the same thing, except instead of a user or a role, I can also type in a, a company. So these companies are something I add to the project and, and I choose users to be in the companies. And I could say the entirety of CMI gets managed permission. And I probably wouldn't do it on the services folder. I would probably do it all the way up here on the project files folder. My team gets access to everything. It's really only people outside that I want to, I want to control on an individual basis. So yeah, it's, it's that simple. I choose the folders and I choose the permissions for the users, the roles, or the companies. John's got a great question. So how long has CMI been using this for production work and what hiccups have been experienced along the way? Um, we've been using it really in production under a year, I would say. Um, it has existed for a number of years. Um, there were the hiccups that we, so we did test it originally and we actually have had a client very early on uh, go to um, implement it and have some trouble kind of shut us away. And those troubles really were around the locking. Um, uh, the locking was, was slow and, uh, and troublesome and like you can't really work on a project with, uh, with that. But about a year ago, um, you know, Autodesk constantly rolling out changes because it's cloud-based, so it's very, also very easy for them to, to make updates. But, uh, you know, just under a year we've been, we've been operating pretty successfully. Uh, Not really any hiccups in the workflow stuff at all. The hiccups were really just that it, it originally wasn't quite ready. The functionality wasn't as seamless as you needed to be to actually use it in production. Uh, Jonathan's got a question about, so how does import of existing projects sync XREFs to sheets? 
Um, so the the uh, honestly the existing project um, synchronization stuff. I don't have an example set up. Uh, it's probably going to take some manual work to get it all updated and working correctly. Um, you can take an existing project and, you know, through Desktop Connector, um, drag and drop a folder into the into the project and get all your folders and files and stuff uploaded. Uh, that being said, um, it doesn't. It does seem to have a little struggle with uh, with some of the existing XREFs and data shortcuts and stuff like that. It's really going to shine with a project built, you know, built in the cloud. But if you do have an existing project that you want to migrate to the cloud, uh, you can use the built-in tool. And then basically, what we would, you know, the only thing we might have to do is uh, is repass those XREFs, um, you know, open the open the child drawing, uh, you know, see the broken XREFs and repass them from the cloud. Uh, so I, I would say that that's a, that there's a little bit of a deficiency there. So that's a good question that. Uh, if, in my experience, when taking an existing project with data shortcuts and, and XREFs and trying to drop it up in here, uh, it does attempt to, you know, resolve everything in the cloud. But uh, I have seen I have seen problems that need manual. Uh, Daryl's asking if I can show what the different permission levels are. Um, I can certainly show you here. Um, so we've got view, uh, view and download, view, download, publish markups. So that you know that right here we're probably still talking project manager. This is somebody who's not using Civil 3D, obviously, um, but they can still push the markups uh, in the cloud. Create adds the ability to upload. Um, edit allows us to edit and uh, manage full administrative controls. That's like delete. Right, so none of these users are able to get rid of a file, but the manager uh, does have full administrative control. And another kind of good point is that the project administrators, so I'm a project administrator on this project, and uh, you can assign any user to be a project administrator. That project administrator role overrides permissions. So a project administrator can see every folder, whether they've explicitly been given permission or not. Um, and so that allows you know those sort of those power users to troubleshoot or whatever it may be. Project. Back to my. Um, set of project folders and subfolders permissions be set up. Yes, John. Uh, a template for project folders and subfolders and permissions can be set up uh, so that you don't have to do it from scratch every time. Yes. Um, under the, just to kind of give you an idea, we've looked at kind of the end users section of all this so far. Uh, under docs, there's also an account admin and a project admin. And so project admin, where I'm going to do things like create the companies uh, and add the people to the project, as I've talked about. And then within account admin, um, is where we're going to get project templates. And basically what we would do is create a project um, with everything set up. And then from that existing project, we can create a project template that contains all that stuff inside of it. Uh, I've got one question about kind of best practices on issues and review frameworks. Um, I, I don't have anything prepared to answer that. If you, uh, somebody that I've got, kind of a personal relationship with. If you would like to reach out, uh, I'd be happy to talk more in depth and look at that uh, with you, Jonathan. Yeah, I don't, I don't have any top of my head. All right, any other uh, questions? Question about the markup process. Yeah, I could jump in and uh, and go through that markup process a little more. Um, project. I believe I have a markup. If we want to see what it looks like when you've got an existing markup, let's see. Um, 
if I look here uh, at these little icons, my corridor base BWG file, uh, you know, I've got a couple little symbols here. The squiggly one is line is the unpublished markups, and then this little crown is a published markup. So this this drawing file does have a markup on it. It's probably not anything useful. Um, but if I jump to this, um, here's a markup. It's a published markup. Um, so if I was going to create a new markup over on the left here, I'll create it. Let's I'll jump in as this other user. So, different user. Here's the markup that you know my first user published, and I can see it. Um, you know, this user is going to create a new markup. So, basically, like this. All pretty rudimentary. Um, ideas, and so. Um, it's funny, you guys asked how long we've been using this in the workflow. I don't do a ton of project work, so I, uh, um, so over here I, I add my text, right? Like, these bots aren't wide enough. And I can add whatever other markups I want. Um, so that's a call out. Right. And I can just saw as well, all right. So it's just, you know, text, <clears throat> text, shapes, uh, these call outs, polylines. Um, that's the kind of stuff that goes in with those, those uh, markups. Each one of these things is a separate markup. So you see, they're kind of just all you know, listed out here, each thing has its own kind of individual markup. But uh, these markups are currently not published. And so if I, as the other, other user I'm looking here, I don't see any, any markups. Uh, so then this user has to actually publish these markups for them to take. And I just select them and then click Publish. Markups are published um, here. We'll refresh. There's the markups that that other user did. And if I look at the markups kind of fly out here, um, I mean, I can see who, who made them and when they made them. That's kind of the extent on the markups. Um, uh, Questions, some more questions about markups. I have no way to bring markups into CAD that I'm aware of. Um, do markups get notifications? How does somebody know the markups exist? Um, no, I don't believe markups themselves do have a notification uh, functionality. Probably the issues are more what we're talking about uh, for, for notification and whatnot. The, um, the issues, like I said, can be assigned to someone. If you assign it to someone when an issue is created, then they're going to get an email saying that they've got an issue, as well as uh, when landing on their home screen. Get, uh, some alerts about some of that stuff as well. So if you get the assigned to me issue information, I don't have a whole lot built out here, but I've got a review assigned to me, issues, RFIs, submittals, all those things. Uh, you know, kind of are tracked in here. Uh, well, yeah, markups are pretty lightweight, honestly. They're, um, you know, uh, one one way I've seen them used is like in the field with the, the app that allows you to, to navigate this stuff. It's like you can take a 
you know, DWG file or a PDF into the field and do those markups in the field. Um, although then I guess the question would come up of uh, AutoCAD. So I don't think that the markups come into AutoCAD right now. Uh, they're pretty lightweight without any uh, notification. I would encourage you guys, uh, if you are interested in considering this, um, like I said, you know, all of this functionality, except for data shortcuts, is built into Autodesk Docs. And I know for a fact that many of you have Autodesk Docs because of your AC collection. So you have the ability to uh, put a small project up in the cloud um, and kind of kind of take it for a test drive. Uh, and then, you know, if that works well, then the next step is BIM Collaborate Pro so that you can run your data shortcuts in the cloud and everything. But, um, yeah, I think uh, taking a look yourself is a good idea as well. But um, throw the throw this slide back up there one more time. If, um, if you guys do have any questions, um, you can reach out to our sales team. Some of you have my personal contact info, I'm sure, as well. Um, but we're happy to put some of our technical people with you um, or, to, uh, uh, or to give you some pricing numbers on this stuff. Uh, that's a good question. John, somebody asked if uh, BIM, ABC Pro, BIM Collaborate Pro, has monthly access. Um, I know you cannot do it with Flex tokens. Um, I believe... Just take a look, because I don't know the answer. We don't sell. We can't sell um, can't sell monthly subscriptions. Those come only through Autodesk. Um, so this would be useful, I imagine. Um, oh, we're not Autodesk Docs. Flex does not have docs. You cannot do any of these cloud things in Flex. Uh, like you can get it for monthly. Yeah, that's a direct Autodesk purchase. We we don't uh, we can't complete those. But yes, they do have monthly subscription to uh, BIM Collaborate. All right. Well, thanks everybody for your time. Um, kind of enough to get your feet wet and hopefully understand the differences between the different products and what they're used for. Um, if you have any questions, let us know, and we'll be happy to happy to answer them. And like I said, if you uh, if you have interest, I would say um, you know get that trial or uh, or use your AAC collection and and uh, into it. All right, everybody. Thanks for your time.